freezing point depression, like all colligative properties, uh, is driven by the change in chemical potential for something for uh, for something when it's in a solution. So we learned earlier that for ideal solutions, chemical potential has this expression. And let's go ahead and use a um, notation here where this is going to be the pure stuff. So the chemical potential of pure stuff, we're going to denote with this asterisk. And here's the chemical potential of stuff in the solution. And this expression is exact as long as we have an ideal solution. Okay, and we talked about the properties of ideal solutions in the last screencast. All right, so when are we going to have freezing point depression? Well, imagine that we have a situation where A is the solvent. And B is a solute. And it's soluble in the solvent when the solvent's a liquid. And, and B is going to be insoluble in solid A. So oh, and the last thing we'll say is that the delta H of fusion of A is going to be constant. Okay, so if we have a small change in temperature from the normal melting temperature, that's a good approximation. So what about this approximation here? Is this, is this something that's ever going to be true? Well, the sort of picture we have in our head is we have a beaker, ooh, crazy beaker. We have a beaker and it's got A liquid in it and then we've got a bunch of B, a bunch of B, some sort of solute. And then we've got solid A. So obviously this isn't water, right? The solid sank to the bottom. And if you freeze something like cyclohexane or other things like that, it will do that. And then we have this equilibrium here. Okay. Now, is it is it likely that, that B would dissolve in the liquid but not in the solid? Yeah. We know that most solids have a crystal structure and that Fitting into that crystal structure is a pretty stringent requirement, um, uh, but but being able to dissolve in the liquid that's that's pretty pretty easy. So something dissolving in the liquid and not the solid that's 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 a pretty common situation. But to actually have this the equations we're going to derive be completely accurate, we also have to say that not only does B dissolve in liquid A, but B forms an ideal solution. in liquid A. Okay? All right. So let's go ahead and see if we fit all three of those requirements, if there's some equation we for, can get for how the freezing point goes down. Before we do that, though, we should look at why the freezing point goes down. Let's go ahead and, and do a mu t graph. So we've got mu for component A. We've got temperature over here. And let's just remember that the slope of the chemical potential with temperature is going to be the negative of the Mohr volume, and in this case, the negative of the Mohr volume of A. Okay, well, um, we know that that means that there are going to be negative slopes, and we saw earlier that first we've got the solid line, and liquids have more entropy, and therefore a steeper slope than, than solids, and then if we have a gas, it's like that. Now imagine we have a solute, so we put B in a liquid. Okay, so we're saying it dissolves in a liquid, but not in a solid, right? It doesn't dissolve in the solid. So a good example would be we put some salt and it dissolves in, it dissolves in water, it doesn't really dissolve in ice, okay? The, the crystal structure of the ice is going to uh, exclude the salt. Well, what's going to happen to the chemical potential of a liquid? It's going to go down, right? Remember, mu A is equal to mu A pure 
plus RT log of XA. So if we put some solute in, the mole fraction of A is no longer 1. It's going to be some number smaller than 1. So this is a negative, this term is negative, and so that makes this, this side, the left-hand side, be, be smaller than pure A. Okay, so the chemical potential has to go down. And so this whole curve is going to go down. And so if we look, this intersection here was the melting point. Call it TM. And this intersection here is the new melting point, right? Because we dissolve stuff into the liquid, but not into the solid. So TM prime is less than TM. The melting point went down, OK? Incidentally, you can see that if you um, have stuff that's uh, a solute that's not going into the gas phase, then this curve is not going to move. And look what happened to our boiling point. Our boiling point went from this temperature to this temperature. That's that's boiling point elevation, and it's it's essentially the same phenomena as uh, freezing point depression. Okay, so let's concentrate now on freezing point depression. So the way to do this derivation is to imagine two different beakers. And we'll just draw them over here. We've got the first beaker where we just have a solid in equilibrium with a liquid. And we know if that's the case, we must be at TM. And we can say that the chemical potential of a solid at TM has to be equal to the chemical potential of a liquid at TM. Oh, and of course, since these are pure, we'll just go ahead and put little pure signs on here. Okay, how do we know that these are equal? Because remember, one of the conditions for phase equilibrium is that the chemical potentials have to be equal. Otherwise, we wouldn't be in equilibrium. All right, let's draw a similar beaker over here. We've got A solid We've got A liquid. The difference is that we've also got a solute in here. So it's a solution, not just pure solvent. And that means the melting point is going to be different. So we'll call it TM prime. Okay? And we can say that the chemical potential of A liquid has to be equal to the chemical potential of A solid. In this case, we're at TM prime. Now we have to have a way of somehow relating uh, how the situation changed when we went from pure stuff to a solution. And fortunately we have an equation for that. Right? We know So let's go ahead and, and uh, do this. Let's go ahead and try to relate these two chemical potentials to these two. So I'll go ahead and put this over here. How can we do this? Well, the first thing we can do is try to relate the temperatures. And we can do that if we remember that chemical potential varies with temperature at constant pressure as a function of the molar entropy. So another way of saying this is that if we were to integrate this, we get d mu is equal to minus s dt as long as we're working at constant pressure. And notice we're not changing any pressures up here, so that's fine. We're working at constant pressure. We can integrate both sides, and we get mu at t2 minus mu at t1 is equal to the value of this integral. So if we assume that uh, the entropy is constant, we can get minus the entropy uh, and then delta T. Okay. So
So we can uh, we can go from any temperature, any reference temperature, to another temperature if we just uh, if we just have the change in temperature in the molar entropy. So let's go ahead and use that tool that we developed down here to adjust these TM primes and relate them to TMs. Okay. So if we do that, let's do that on the next page. Our original equation, where we're looking at compounds at TM prime, the new melting point, and we can relate that to their equilibrium at TM. So we'll just rewrite what we had on the previous page, and then we'll throw in that entropy term. So if we take the chemical potential of a solid at the original melting point, and then have that adjustment term of the molar entropy, and on this side would be the molar entropy of A solid times delta T, which is what? Well, it's the final melting temperature Tm prime minus the original melting temperature Dm. So that is this whole thing here is that, right? And then we're going to do the same thing on the right-hand side. So we have the chemical potential of A liquid at Tm minus the molar entropy of A liquid times delta T. So the new temperature minus the old melting temperature. Okay, so that gives us how the chemical potentials of these two things, and I can do the same thing here, I guess. This whole thing is the right-hand side here. Okay, so all I've done is, is take, is relate the, the chemical potentials at the new temperature, the new melting temperature, to the chemical potentials at the original melting temperature. What I want to do now is relate these chemical potentials of impure stuff, of solution, to pure chemical potentials. And for that, I use the equation, I'll just write it here, the chemical potential is equal to chemical potential of pure stuff plus RT log of mole fraction. So if we're talking about A, this would be this. Right? So this is the this is the most important equation for ideal solutions. So let's use it now. So we're going to plug that in for this term, and we're going to plug it in for this term here. And so we get chemical potential of A solid pure at Tm plus RT log of Xa in the solid minus the molar entropy of A solid times delta T, which is Tm prime minus Tm, is equal to the chemical potential of pure liquid at Tm plus RT log of the mole fraction of A in the liquid phase minus the molar entropy of A liquid times delta T, which remember we said was Tm prime minus Tm. Okay, it looks like a lot, but a lot of stuff's going to cancel out here. Because we remember, we said that the solid A was pure. Let's go ahead and write that. A solid was pure. Remember, the B did not dissolve in the solid phase A, which means the mole fraction of A in the solid phase is equal to 1. So the log of 1 is equal to 0, so this whole term goes away. Okay, that's, that's a start. Uh, the second thing we can remember is back on the previous page, we said, hey, remember that left-hand beaker? And the left-hand beaker, I guess you could just rewind here and look at that. We said, wait a second. These two things have to be pure, right? At the normal melting temperature, pure A and A solid and A liquid are in equilibrium, which means these cancel out. They're equal, so we can cancel them. All right, so we're almost done here. The last thing we can do is we could combine the entropy terms, okay? Because we could remember, I'll just write it up here, that delta S of fusion, we could define that as the molar entropy of liquid minus the molar entropy of solid. So if we remember that definition, we could put these entropy terms on the left-hand side, right? We could say, I've got the molar entropy of liquid, and it becomes positive when I put it on the left-hand side, times this delta T here, minus the molar entropy, so I'm just bringing this term down, 
the molar entropy of a solid times delta t. And then I can, wait, let's, what's left on this side? It's just rt log of xa. Remember that's xa in the liquid phase. Okay, I can just, hey, wait a minute. That is just the change in entropy, delta s of fusion. So delta s of fusion, and we're talking about delta s of fusion for A, the solvent, times delta T, how much the melting point changed, is equal to RT log of XA. All right, and so um, if we wanted to, we could just solve for delta T. Let's go ahead and do that on the next page. So we have delta s of fusion times Tm prime minus Tm is equal to Rt log of Xa, the liquid phase, and so we could solve for delta T. How much does the melting point change? And when we solve for that, we see it's equal to Rt log of Xa, the solvent in the liquid phase, divided by delta S of fusion, and if we wanted to, we could just uh, uh, replace it with the delta H over T. And so we get RT, and the T we're talking about is the, the melting temperature. And we get this equation. This is the one that's, that you've seen in your textbook. So notice what happens. If we have any mole fraction here other than one, this is gonna be a negative number. And so this whole thing, since delta H fusion is a positive number, this whole thing comes out to be negative, and we get delta T that's negative. In other words, the freezing point goes down. Oh, and if we want to, we can use an approximation here. We don't have to, and we can't unless it's a dilute solution, but I'll go ahead and put it down here. If dilute, in other words, if xb, the mole fraction of solute, is much, much less than 1, then I can simplify this a little bit more, say delta t is equal to rt squared log of, and we'll just convert this to 1 minus the mole fraction of solute, right, because it's a two-component mixture, so the two mole fractions have to add to, to 1, and if I do this, then I can say, oh, if it's dilute, if this is a small, there's that, that series approximation we can do where we replace the logarithm of 1 plus x with just being equal to x. That's just a little math trick, right? So then we have delta H effusion down here. And this equation, note, is only valid if the solution is very dilute. So for dilute solutions, we have this. And notice what this says. This says that the freezing point depression is going to be linear with concentration of solute. And so the sort of gen chem expression that you had was delta T M was going to be equal to some uh, cryoscopic constant times the molality of solute. This was the gen chem expression. So it's a linear expression and you can see, you can actually get that constant, you can calculate that constant using this expression, uh, which is also linear, but it breaks down if you try to get a more, uh, if you have more concentrated solution, you, you can't use it. You have to use the one that's logarithmic and not the linear one, okay?